The scientific term for warts is papillomas. So warts are just papillomas. And that's typically the term for warts that happen on your fingers or on your toes. If they happen on your genitals, the term for that are condyloma. So condyloma acuminatum, acuminatum. Or if we're talking about multiple, condyloma acuminata. And both genital warts and classic warts are due to the virus known as human papillomavirus. Human papillomavirus. Or maybe you've heard of it called HPV. Now HPV has a couple of subtypes and I'll write these numbers down here and I'll explain the significance in a little bit, but there are subtypes 6, 11, 16, and 18. And one of the things that makes HPV such an interesting infection is that 90% of those infected have no symptoms, meaning they don't develop warts, but they're still contagious and can spread the infection to others. And the way you spread an infection is through transmission. That's why we call these sexually transmitted infections, so transmission. And that includes sex, which can be vaginal sex, anal sex, or oral sex. Childbirth is another important mode of transmission where an infected mother that may have a wart can spread it to her child during labor. But another way we can spread it is by sharing clothes where an infected person that has a wart can spread it to a person that doesn't have warts. And finally, a person can auto-inoculate themselves. Now what does that mean? Auto-inoculate. Inoculate means almost like to inject something into a person or to put some type of infectious particle into another place. So auto-inoculation means, say if a person has a condyloma acuminatum and then scratches it, they can then spread that wart onto their fingers and get papillomas. So that's auto-inoculation. But let's say now that we've got an HPV, how does the virus cause symptoms? Well, the study of how a disease occurs is called pathophysiology. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of HPV. And for starters, I'll draw out this cell right here. And this cell has a nucleus that I'll draw dotted so we can see what's going on inside. And its nucleus has some DNA. So I'll draw the DNA like that. And I'll label that DNA. And this is our nucleus here. Now, if an HPV virus attacks, I'll use a square to symbolize HPV. So let's say HPV attacks right there. If you had a really, really strong microscope and you looked at HPV, you can see that this virus has a shell that's called a nucleocapsid. This is the nucleocapsid shell, and it contains proteins that'll help inject things into the cell here. It also contains its own viral DNA. So I'll label this guy viral DNA. And then on top of that, the HPV virus also houses these types of proteins that exist here. So I'll draw a few of them and label that protein for now, and I'll explain what they do in a minute. But for starters, the nucleocapsid uses the proteins on this shell, this outer shell, to inject the viral DNA into our host or human cell here. So this is like a skin cell that lives on your hand, and so we're trying to see how a wart develops. So the first step here is that we inject the viral DNA and some of the proteins into the cell. So once you inject the DNA, you'll get this cell over here. So let me just reproduce the cell we have on the left that now contains the viral DNA and these proteins that I mentioned came along with it. These proteins then will help the viral DNA become incorporated with the DNA of the host cell or the human cell. So the next step over here is that we incorporate the viral DNA. So what you'll get over here is the cell that we had from the beginning that now contains that segment of viral DNA incorporated into the DNA within the nucleus. Now from here there are two different paths that we can follow. So there's one path that goes this way and I'll draw another path that goes down here. So let's go in this direction first. One thing that can happen is that now that the viral DNA is in the nucleus of the host cell, it can direct the proteins that are being synthesized in the cell towards making viruses so we can mass produce the virus. So over here, you'll see a ton of viral copies that exist. So I'll draw a bunch of these guys in here, hanging out and taking up a ton of space. And remember, each of these hold viral DNA. And so they're going to be all of the viral DNA copies in here. And there are proteins in there as well. And in fact, this occurs to such a great extent that the cell can't handle it. So what ends up happening in this cell right here is that there's an overload of viral copies that we're going to have taking up space in here. 
And these viruses are going to be made of proteins that should have been used towards helping the cell survive and reproduce. So what happens is that the cell will rupture. So I'll write over here, the cell will rupture. And I'll draw this membrane here accordingly, it's broken. And the rupture of this cell will then allow these viral copies to escape and move on to infect another cell nearby. So because this phase of the HPV life cycle ended with the rupture or the lysis of the cell, we call this the lytic phase. This is the lytic phase. Alternatively, down here, the virus can remain dormant and instead reproduce with the cell. So now there are two copies of the cell here. And this can keep going on and on. We can keep reproducing the viral DNA within the nucleus of the host cell without ever killing the cell. This relatively more docile phase of the HPV life cycle is referred to as the lysogenic phase. The lysogenic phase, where lyso, you might recall, is from lysis, which means to rupture a cell, and genic just means the potential to. So, so this phase has the potential to go to the lytic phase. And so we can draw that. This lysogenic phase can potentially go toward the lytic phase. And ultimately, the key trigger for going from the lysogenic phase to the lytic phase is stress. And that can be from going out in the sunlight, being emotionally stressed, having decreased immunologic function. All of these things can lead towards the lytic phase. And it's through the lytic phase that we end up getting symptoms. And by symptoms, I really just mean this where warts occur. And so they can happen on the hand or they can happen on the genitals. So I'll highlight that wart right there. But I think the key thing I want to highlight here is not that single symptom that HPV can cause, but the complications that are associated with an HPV infection. And that is cervical and penile cancer. So cervical and penile cancer, which are both very terrible diseases you can get. And they happen most commonly with HPV types 16 and 18. So that clearly means we want to be able to diagnose whenever we've got risk for developing cervical or penile cancer. And so let's talk about steps for diagnosis. Most commonly a history and then on physical exam when you find this wart here, that's usually enough to make your diagnosis. But if you want something that's a little more technical, one of the things that can be done is a biopsy of the wart. And you can look at that biopsy under a microscope. So a biopsy meaning you'll take a needle sample. So here's a needle that'll stab this wart right here. And what you should see are a couple of cells. So I'll redraw a cell over here. And in particular, the cell should have a large nucleus. So I'm going to try and draw this larger than the nucleus that we were looking at down here. So this is a large nucleus. And they tend to be dark. And then on top of that, the nucleus will have this type of halo that exists around it. It's called a perinuclear halo or a perinuclear clearing which all together give the appearance of what's called a coilocyte. A coilocyte. And these are suggestive of a viral infection of the cell. And unfortunately, it's not very specific, though, because there are many viruses that can cause this coilocytic appearance. So what other tests can we do? Well, the next thing that can be done is what's called a DNA hybridization test. And that's just where you take a swab sample. So here's our swab, and there's our sample from a wart, so we'll swab this wart. And we hope that we got a sample of DNA from the virus there, and we'll add that to this well. And so we might have some of the HPV virus there. And what we do to this well is that we run a polymerase chain reaction, or a PCR. And what that gives us here are a bunch of extra copies of the viral DNA that help suggest that it's HPV. And on top of that, we'll add a fluorescent tag. So I'll just write tag here, which will hybridize or bind to the viral DNA if it's present to give it a shiny or a bright result, helping us realize that we indeed have HPV here. All right, so now that we've made our diagnosis, how do we treat HPV? Well, the mainstay of treatment for HPV, which is in contrast to most other sexually transmitted infections, is to burn off the wart. And because that's the only symptom, that usually takes care of the problem. And things that you can use to burn off the wart are liquid nitrogen or salicyclic acid. So I'll write here salicyclic acid. But what about if we want to catch the HPV early? How do we prevent it? Well, the mainstay of preventing any sexually transmitted infection is to block transmission. And in the case of sex, 
That means you want to decrease the amount of direct contact, which for vaginal, anal, and oral sex means the use of condoms. Specifically with oral sex, that can also be achieved through the use of dental dams. Now, if a pregnant woman has HPV and you want to diminish the risk of passing it on to a baby, you can deliver that baby through C-section to limit the contact the baby will have with active warts. For these other two, you avoid sharing clothes or auto-inoculating yourself if you scratch a wart in one place and then touch elsewhere. But I think what's the most interesting thing about HPV is that you can actually prevent cervical or penile cancer most directly with an HPV vaccine. And the HPV vaccine actually targets HPV type 6, 11, 16, and 18, which are the four most common causes of cervical or penile cancer which is crazy when you think about it, that a vaccine can actually be used to prevent cancer before it actually ever happens. That's amazing.